Hey folks, today we're talking about performing and who can be a performer? Spoiler, everyone, right? It's so easy to think that you are not ready to share your work or you're not equipped or you don't have the tools. But today I'm talking to Rachel, Rachel Oates, and she is going to explain why we all have the tools. Rachel's an amazing YouTuber. If you haven't seen her videos already, where have you been? Check them out. Uh, but just as importantly, recently has been stepping onto the stage IRL and doing some incredible poetry performance so we just made a video over on her channel all about my EP coming out pre-save if you haven't already or download it and we wanted to speak about how we both came to poetry a little bit later in life Rachel you've always been a fan of poetry is that true to say oh my god yeah I've been like the biggest nerd about it like when I was a kid I had this notebook that I carried around everywhere with me and I wrote like these little poems about like snails and butterflies and how I was going to grow up to be an astronaut because that's a realistic dream <laughs> and I was like but if I'm not an astronaut I'm going to be a poet okay they're just they are the two options <laughs> so okay. obviously I had a very direct career path in mind um, but yeah I, I loved it and then as I got older and I kind of got up to secondary school I kind of fell out of love with poetry a bit and it kind of felt like we were just having a bunch of rich white men pushed on us and I was like I don't really relate to this. I don't really get it. And it stopped being fun for me until I got this amazing teacher when I was like 16. Um, his name was Warren Lever and he inspired my love of poetry again. And he introduced me to these amazing working class poets who'd grown up just like I did and who lived in Yorkshire just like I did and wrote with the same Yorkshire accent that I had back at the time. And you know, I felt finally like I could relate to it. And then from him, he introduced me to a bunch of feminist poets. And suddenly I was like, oh my God, again, these are my people. And I absolutely loved it for years, but I never got that confidence back to write again and actually write for myself until I was about 27. So it was like a good 10 years after I fell back in love with poetry that I actually allowed myself to write again. And mm -hmm. once I started, it was terrifying, but at the same time, so freeing. Mm. And I didn't get on a stage and perform until last year when I was 29. So by some people's standards, that's like a little bit older, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that old. No, and we're very young. We are yes, very young. We are youthful. We are exuberant. Yes. We get ID'd when we go out together. So look at us. <laughs> it's I think you touched on so many incredible points and that thing around education, especially in, in this country, in the UK, I see it in music all the time. Children are told that they're not that good at something or it's not mm -hmm. their thing or it's not for them. And they internalize this yeah. and through the years they go on and on and on and they are like, oh, I, I can't sing. I don't do mm -hmm. music or I don't do poetry or I don't do whatever. And to kind of eat that back out of an adult to be like, you can do it and you might be rubbish at it at first, but you will get better. It's so difficult. One of my mum's favourite lines growing up was like, oh, it's not for folks like us. That was her thing because we were a family of like, literally my family were farmers and nail makers. And um, one of them worked in a cloth hall and stuff like that. And mm. even my mum uh, worked in a supermarket. My dad did factory work. So when mm. I had all these like lofty dreams of, poetry and writing and all this not for folks like us not for us we don't do that yeah you know? and I mean, it took so long to deconstruct that mindset and right. allow myself to be who I wanted to be you know yeah whether whether that's class race gender mm -hmm. any other reason to know there kind of are no folks like you any folks yeah. be doing anything that they want to that's yeah it's a real kind of unpicking to get there isn't yeah. it it's hard because like I find especially like being a YouTuber is a weird one because on the one hand there's no barrier to entry anymore anyone can do it you just need something that can record anyone can do it even with a cheap phone you don't need like the fancy camera setup and everything like that um but at the same time it's kind of intimidating like I didn't start my YouTube channel until I was 25 I think something like that maybe 24 and at that point I already felt too old to be doing it because I was looking around at these other popular creators and they'd started when they were like 17, 18. The other people who were up and coming, they were like 20, 21. And mm. I, it sounds stupid, but at 24, I already felt, am I too old for this? Is it too late for me? And now I'm turning 30 mm. and there's still up and coming people who are like 20 and 21. And I'm like, yeah, but it's fine. And I feel more comfortable with 
my age now. If that makes no, sense. but I think that's such a, an amazing thing about aging. I remember the first time when I realized that I couldn't be a prodigy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, great for prodigies, great for people who are, you know, excelling at things really young. Like, we are only going to continue to age, hopefully, and what a blessing. Mm -hmm. And to know that the people, your peers, whoever they are, they may not be the same age as you. And similarly, the people who are the same age as you may be doing completely different things from yeah. you. And I think it's it's such a school thing, isn't it? Oh, I'm in year four. Like, you know, yeah. as we, as you get out of that world, it's, it's nice to hope that, um, those ages you know it doesn't matter um i have a friend that speaks about age in terms of like specific things so like you mm. might be like 14 in cooking but you might be like you know 22 in sewing but like yes. seven in like skiing or I don't know, whatever and i think that's such a nice way to think about it because i am decidedly a zero in skiing <laughs> I don't, me too. Like, such a rogue choice <laughs> oh you know these everyday things people do cooking sewing <laughs> skiing <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> either. Like, it would make sense if I would like shoot you shoot, shoot. Like, <laughs> are you a secret skier <laughs> I'm not a secret skier <laughs> um but so this idea because so I teach quite a lot and mm. I often find adults come and they get a lot more frustrated than children um is that mm. something you found kind of coming to, to sit down to write poems again at a slightly older age um yes and no I think for me it's the frustration comes from lack of time when mm. you're a kid you have all this free time to do stuff in and it's like if you're not at school it's basically free time and right. you can you can do what you want and so you have all this time to you know paint and draw and do poetry and do sport and learn an instrument and all that sort of thing um but then when you're older you're like oh and especially when you're self-employed you're like I need to be working all the time must be working so sometimes I get frustrated about not having enough time to do the things that I love and that I want to do but mm. then I just want to have to be a bit strict with myself and be like no give yourself time off to have fun <laughs> well yeah. it's, it's like that thing isn't it when you're lucky enough to have your mm. hobby be your job suddenly mm. you don't have a hobby anymore yeah so it's it's difficult um that's the kind of weird thing about now that I'm performing and I've got my poetry book out for people to buy and stuff, it's on the one hand, it means I don't feel so guilty about taking time off to write and perform and stuff like that. But at the same time, it does sometimes make it feel like work. So mm -hmm. it's difficult. I think one thing I enjoy about not just poetry, but like learning hobbies in general now that I'm a bit older is that I finally don't have any monetary barriers to, barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. So that was always an issue I had when I was a kid. Like mm. we couldn't afford anything. We mm. didn't have the time or the money for me to do anything. So I love painting, but I couldn't afford to have any decent paints. So mm. I was using you know, like dried out markers or like, <laughs> I remember at one point stealing used tea bags to turn them into paint so I could paint with them. <laughs> it's That's so creative though. It's incredible. You just, you make do with what you have, you know? Now I feel very, very lucky that I'm older and, you know, I'd, I'd live quite comfortably and I've got my own money and stuff that I can actually invest in myself and my hobbies. And you do see it being paid back, you know, like even now I think like, oh, you know, however much for a new set of paints is, is quite a lot of money. But then I think about it in other terms, I'm like, okay, but imagine how much fun I'm going to have out of this, how many hours I can spend using these. And then on the other hand, now, because my job is so creative, I can also say like, well, okay, if I create art with this, how many prints do I have to sell to make my money back on this? Mm. And it kind of puts it into a different perspective and it makes it a bit more accessible, which is nice. And yeah. you spoke about being strict with yourself, kind of mm -hmm. making time. Do you have a writing schedule or anything that formalized? Oh, hell no. <laughs> I'm, I'm too scatterbrained for that <laughs> all over the place. So how do you make sure that you make time to make poetry? I listen to what my body needs to do and I know that sounds really like vague and douchey but <laughs> um I so I I only got diagnosed with autism like two years ago and I didn't know before then that I was autistic but I would always go through these um I guess like phases of hyper focus and being obsessed with something and needing to learn everything about it and do everything related to something and before I tried to suppress that because I thought it was weird and I thought it made me unusual but now I know what 
causes that. I know why I'm like that. So I can embrace it a bit more. And it means that like when I know I'm hyper-focusing on something now, I make the most of it. And I'm like, okay, so I'm hyper-focused on this. Let's just smash out 20 hours of work on it in one day and I'll, I'll know it's okay. It's not like a dangerous, weird thing to do or anything like that. So it's the same with videos. When I get really interested in a topic and I want to work on it, I just pour all my time and energy into it. And then afterwards I'm like, okay, now I know my body needs to relax. I can spend the day painting or something like that, or I can spend the day writing poetry or whatever. And it's, it's nice. It's just about listening to my body and my brain and what it needs at different times. And you get to know yourself as you get older, I think, which is nice and listen to yourself more. And mm. yeah, I hope anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm getting there. So you've made some poems, let's imagine, or you've made whatever your mm-hmm. artwork is. Yeah. My first question is, how do you know if it's good? Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> um, well, my first question is more, how do I know if this is bad? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's that's my first thing. And I'm always like, okay, well, how does it make me feel to like, basically, I step away from it for a while. I put it away. Mm. I don't look at it. I don't read it. Nothing like that. And I come back to it. I'm like, how does this make me feel? And if I don't hate it, that's a great sign. I'm like, okay, now we can move forward. Mm-hmm. <laughs> When it comes to, I guess like poetry is the big one that I struggle with because a lot of what I write about is so personal to me. It's like really difficult and heavy topics. Like I've spoken a lot about a lot of struggles I went through when I was a kid and issues with my family. I've written a lot about um, trying, I don't know how long we get like that personal, but I've spoken a lot about an abusive relationship I was in in my poems. I've written a lot about physical abuse I've written a lot about um, issues I had with a teacher of mine who maybe took advantage a little bit and stuff like that. And I've written about aging and getting older and my body and just, you know, accepting all that stuff about me. And it's hard to detach from that when you've written something so personal and you're like, okay, but how do I objectively know this is good? And sometimes you can look through a poem and be like, oh, okay, there's a decent metaphor here. There's a, you know, nice bit of rhythm here or whatever. But Sometimes you don't really know if it's good or not until you show it to other people. And that's why I've really enjoyed performing the open mic nights because mm. the amount of people who come up, come up to me afterwards and like, oh, I love, love that poem. You really spoke to me about this. And they share their stories with me that like, you know, things that my poem made them think about or that they've experienced and that, like when I get that, I'm like, okay, now I know it's good because it's reaching people in the way I want it to. So it's something about the connection rather than it being good in isolation it's like when it reaches someone else yeah exactly that I think I can write a poem for myself and about myself and I'm like okay well like maybe it's average but if it doesn't do anything for the reader or listener it's not a good poem to me it's like my videos you know sometimes I'll make a video for fun just for myself like I did one the other day on the history of gin and like the feminist history of gin it was really really oh I missed this (laughs) I'll send you a link. It's great. But I knew it wasn't going to get very many views because it's not really what people come to my channel for. But I was like, I just want a little self-indulgent project. It's going to be fun. And I liked it. But then other times I'll make a video and the ones that I get the most views on are the ones where I think, okay, well, like, what is the viewer going to get out of this? What are they going to learn from this? What questions are they going to ask themselves about this? You know, why should they give me their time? And it's the same with a poem. Why should they give me their time to listen to it or read it? And so for me, a good poem is one that the reader or listener actually gets something out of. And I try and put some of that in every poem I write, even when it's a personal one. And Mm. it's hard sometimes. But I love the idea that kind of like you, the artist is kind of here Mm -hmm. and the audience or the listener or whoever is over there. And then the kind Mm -hmm. of artistry exists almost in the space between you two. That's such a lovely, I can see that. (laughs) I I feel like that I have similar thoughts about kind of performing actually Mm -hmm. because when I get really nervous before my shows or or before anything the thing that calms me is to remember that the audience wants to be here the audience has you know chosen to be here and they're not here to see me do something they're here to have a shared experience like some of the best things at a gig is when everyone is singing along and like of course yeah you're there to see the performer but that feeling of being in a thousand person crowd singing one person's songs, you know, it, it's about everyone in that room, everyone's playing their part. Uh, so that helps me when I get very nervous. What things help you before you perform? <laughs> you mean other than a glass of wine? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, God, a lot of practice. 
it, it's kind of what I do. I feel like so uh, last Tuesday night, I had a bit of a wobble because I was supposed to be performing at this open mic night and they changed the, sorry, not an open mic night, a poetry night. And they changed the performance slots at the last minute. Mm-hmm. So I thought I had a 10 minute performance slot. And they were like, oh, sorry, we're changing up the format the entire night. Everyone now only has four minutes. And I was like, oh, that's a big, big difference. And I was freaking out because the poem I practiced and was ready to do and was prepared to do was a nine minute poem. So I had to rethink it. And I was like, oh, God, like, I don't have any practice poems that can fit in this time slot that I haven't done for this crowd before. So I was like, do I do one of them? and like feel comfortable but risk boring them? Or do I do a new one that's unpracticed? And I decided to throw myself in at the deep end and do two shorter new ones that I had never performed in front of anyone before, had never even practiced before. I was just like, oh God, but I did it. And um, afterwards I came off stage and I had a little cry because I just felt really overwhelmed. And I was like, oh my God. But my partner was there and he was like, hey, no, you were amazing. You were great, don't worry. And he like hyped me up. And then um, I actually had a guy come over and he was like saying how much he loved the performance. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe it wasn't so bad. And mm. it turns out in that crowd, I actually had a fan who'd come up from London to see me, um, but the other side of London. So he traveled four hours to come and see me perform four minutes of poetry. And I was like, oh my God, bless him. And he was, he was so excited and happy and he loved it and he was so supportive. And I was like, okay, that makes all the wobbliness and the fear and the anxiety and everything worth it. And it was good. But at the same time, I think sometimes it's good to have some nerves and push yourself out of your comfort zone a bit. Oh you know? yeah, no, I think the nerves, I, I think of the nerves as excitement, as mm. my body telling me, okay, we're going to do something on stage. Like remember not to pick your nose, like remember to kind of like <laughs> have that performance energy on. Uh, but bit um, that you speak to another really important point of going in prepared like I always mm. say be as prepared as you can like you know listen to it in the shower like do it while you're making <laughs> tea, all of those things and yet in that moment of performance something will go wrong it will go differently like whatever you intended to do whether it's you know you walk to one bit of the, you know whatever something will go wrong how do you deal with things going wrong when you're performing so The first time I had something go wrong was I stumbled over my words in our second Glastonbury performance. And I was like, oh my God, I've ruined it. And like my, it was like half a second. I've watched back the video. I stopped for like maybe two seconds and it felt like three hours. And all these thoughts went through my mind and I freaked out and I looked over at Daisy on stage and she went, and then I was just like, oh my God, this. And I just carried on. And again, after, like after I finished I went over to Daisy I was like I love you so much I gave her a big hug and she made me realize that even when you mess up the crowd don't mind because you're human they're human they understand what it's like they're supportive and ever since then like I've had a couple of little stumbles but it's not been so bad like one of the poems I did on Tuesday has this horrific line in it and I don't know why I wrote it because I don't know if you know this about me but I had to have my front teeth taken out when I was really really young like two and a half so I didn't have front teeth at all until I was about nine years old and my adult teeth came in so I was learning to speak without any front teeth which meant I had a bit of a lisp and then my teeth came in and I had no idea where to put my tongue because suddenly there were these things in my mouth so it was kind of like almost learning to speak all over again so I've always had an issue with saying s's and and sh sounds and sk sounds and all that stuff and for some stupid reason in this poem I wrote a line that has alliteration of s and sh sounds and I I can't get it out I just can't I tried that line three times that night until I finally got it and I was like oh god's sake but it was fine after I'd done it I just like made a joke about you know like having a little bit of a lisp when I was younger and how that came out again and the crowd laughed and it was fine yeah I mean, because that's the that's the real human connection. Like, that's what we want to see. The reason why mm-hmm. you don't go and see a band or someone live and they just play the record yeah. is because, like, yeah, we can all hear it probably in better quality. You mm-hmm. know, like, a recording is this kind of perfect ideal of yeah. it. But what we want to hear is the, the, the real, real, that live version that can never be done again because that exists in that moment. So if that's, you know, yeah. a slight, something goes slightly wrong, like, that's almost more real, isn't it? Yeah. In some um, ways, I think, you know, like ooh, having a little bit of a, like a, a lisp and a, 
I don't want to say like slur in my words, but like stumbling over them. It is part of who I am. And I think if they want to see me perform, then that's a part of me. And sometimes I feel like I need to remind myself of that a bit and stop yeah. beating myself up for not being perfect. You, know? you need to perform as you. That's what they've come to see. Mm. And what you said about having a cheerleader in the crowd is so, so, so important. Mm. Like whenever I'm speaking or anything, and that's why Zoom was so difficult, mm. is that I want to look at an in amongst all of the bored faces. Yeah. If I see one, ideally someone that I already know, but sometimes people, strangers just like, give you that openness. They just hype you up, don't they? <laughs> yeah, you just find like one or two people because then suddenly you're not speaking to, you know, tens or hundreds of people. You're just having a one-on-one conversation and other people are just listening in. Yeah. Um, so finding that person who is like maybe laughing if you make a joke or like giving you that like continue energy, like I think that's so important because people, while you do need to address the whole crowd, mm-hmm. you get that good vibe back from whether it's your friends or your family or your partner, like they're sending you the love. You've just yeah. got to focus on that right <laughs> it's nice I've never really had it before where I've had like a constant cheerleader and it's nice you know like my, my parents and my family never really supported me doing anything creative when I was younger so if I wanted to do anything like when I started getting into gig photography I was just going out by myself and like mm. going to gigs alone and doing it that way and no one ever really like cheered me on or helped or anything and it was the same with like my ex he didn't really get any of this and like even when I lived with him and stuff the first time I had an offer to speak at a big conference he could have come with me all expenses paid and he was just like nah I can't be bothered and it was in Texas like he, oh my gosh. he just couldn't be bothered to come with me so that I kind so of the opposite of being a cheerleader I know right so I broke up with him not very long after that <laughs> actually before I even went to Texas I broke up with him <laughs> but I don't know I just kind of for a long time I got used to doing everything by myself and independently and there's a resilience in that but also it's very, it's really tiring so then when I met Kieran and I was like oh I've got I've got this poetry performance do you want to come with me he was like yes yes of course I'm gonna be there and he's mm-hmm. literally been at every single one of my performances since we've been together like even if he's had a long day he's like I'll be there and he's and just like that- it's finding your community, finding those people who hold you up again in person yeah. or online, long long range, finding those people who do agree with like generally what you're making. Yeah. And then also aren't scared to say, but this bit is rubbish. Like <laughs> <laughs> this line, or you know, like let's let's improve yeah. this line, let's do that. Like um, I was I was recording something, my partner was there like helping me record, mm-hmm. and I got to the end and she was just like, You can do it better. <laughs> oh bless her. <laughs> Which you is, so, and it was true, and it was yeah. so good. And it's like, I, you know, you don't need a yes person. You don't need someone that's always like 100% that was like the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah. You need someone who you trust to be honest. And sometimes I will go to someone and say, I want advice, I want you to tear it apart. Yeah. Sometimes I'll go and just be like, I'm really scared of this. Is it like, okay? Yeah. And, you know, you're asking for such different things. And so I always encourage people to share things online Mm-hmm. Um, but to be very explicit about what kind of sharing this is. Some people yeah. are like, I've just written this. I'd love some criticism or some improvement. Other people are like, this is the first time I've ever recorded anything and shared it online and I filled it on my phone, just balanced on this, you know, all of this stuff. And you just want to be like, this is so cool. I love this thing you've done. Like, let me hype you up. And I think, you know, finding the right audience, audience. to give you the right yeah. moment. Yeah. I get that completely. It's weird because like, I am sort of known for my, poetry critiques and reviews and stuff like that online and some people can say I can be a little bit harsh because I guess I have been with some slightly lazier published poets before it's like you you know who I mean (laughs) I don't really like to talk about it publicly anymore you know since she called me a bitch but (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. who knows um but I'm like yeah well I, I was harsh about that because she's charging a lot of money for a product that Honestly, she admits she didn't put any real effort into. Like, there's literally whole pages saying this is page filler and stuff like that. So, like, I feel like I can be harsh about that. But at the same time, I was constructive in that I wasn't just, you know, being like, oh, this is terrible and rubbish. I was being like, okay, I see what you were doing, but here's how a different poet did that, but better. But then I think people get confused when they then see me, like, you know, if a fan sends me some work or something and they're like, oh, be, be as harsh, harsh as you want with the critique. And I'm like, I don't think I can be because like, mm. you're a fan of mine and I feel like all I want to do is support you and hype you up 
and like help you out and stuff and they're like well but you're so harsh about so and so and I'm like yeah but you're not them like yeah you're you're trying and you're learning and I don't want to be harsh to you I just want to tell you what I like and help you and stuff and it's the same with friends sometimes like you know if um so like Daisy invited me to this like writing retreat a while back which is where we film some of my poetry performances as well and it was it was lovely it was really amazing but I remember there was a point where she was sat outside with I think Joel and they were working on a song and Daisy kept like asking for my advice with stuff and be like oh what do you think about this and I was like telling her and helping her and stuff and it was because she asked if she was just like so at the end of the day like we all got together and like a few of them were like performing some of their songs and stuff I think it would have been inappropriate then for me to turn around and be like oh actually excuse me I don't like line three in verse two or like I think that would have been douchey you know yeah I, know, I, really, I mean so I I made a hashtag um so people mm-hmm. could make little videos of them playing and if they use the hashtag handpan sos <laughs> um <laughs> then I can like I like give them some yeah. specific feedback like a little oh, like a tiny little that's lesson cute which is super fun and really interesting. But that's someone saying, hey, I want yeah. some critique. What I'm not doing <laughs> going around <laughs> on any old person's video and being like, this is terrible, <laughs> you know? And like, I, you, we have such a funny, it's such a balance, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like we want to grow, we want to nurture. Um, and yet we need to be kind and we need to see the shoots of something, what may grow into the flower rather than being like, why aren't you a field already? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, no, that makes and, sense. But one more thought: um, Do you feel that you extend yourself the same types of internal criticism? In I'm harsh to myself, or I'm not harsh enough. Both. I feel like I'm rudest to myself about yeah. my poems. I'm rude. Like how? Yeah. How yeah. do you kind of turn down that internal voice? So you made a piece. So yeah, you made I a piece. Don't. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so remember, viewers, if you made me think poetry, it's terrible. Rachel Lloyd said so. No, I mean, like, I, I don't encourage other people to be as harsh as I am, but it's just, I don't know, it, it's something I probably do need to be kinder to myself with. But there is also, so one thing I have learned is, so there's this poet called Savannah Brown, who um, she's released a couple of self, a, a couple of poetry books now, and the first one she released, she self-published and it got a lot of attention I think it was called graffiti and it, it's really good for a first collection there's a few things that were obviously like you know underdeveloped or under edited uh, needed a bit more work a few things that weren't quite as original as they could have been and stuff like that but honestly for a first collection really really good and it showed so much promise that she's then gone on to fulfill in her later works and she's really really good now but what I loved is I got one of her books that well her, her first book I got a republishing of it Mm. and it had a new foreword in it and she wrote in about how um you know a couple of years on now looking back she was like I can see all these faults in these poems and all these flaws and all this sort of thing but you know and I could have gone back and changed them and edited them for this edition but I'm just gonna let it be because that's kind of what art is it's about Mm. creating something in the moment and putting it out there into the world and letting it be and that's something that's really, really inspired me with my own work. Because like when I was working on my own like first poetry pamphlet, it's it's a really short little thing. It's called Reflections on Healing and it's 17 poems. And it's also a photography collection. So it's got photos going alongside all the poems. I worked on that for so long and I kept thinking it wasn't going to be finished. It wasn't going to be done. It wasn't good enough and all this stuff. And then in the end, I set myself this deadline and I was like, I am going to get this out in time for Christmas this year or last year I was like I'm gonna get it out in time for Christmas I set myself that deadline I was like I'm gonna do it to the best of its ability until then and then I'm gonna stop because Mm. that's that's it done and even now looking back I can see things I would change I have certain poems in there where I'm like oh god that wasn't good enough like compared to these others was it but it's done and I'm proud of it and I wouldn't change it now for the world because yeah that's my little baby yeah it is a baby it's mm. like we kind of I sit on so many things I sit on so much music until it's good enough or it's ready yeah. but I think that's such a beautiful point that it's never gonna be finished yeah. right you're never gonna be like I could do no more on that but there <laughs> just comes a point where you and setting yourself a deadline is such a good way of doing that where I will not change it after that I'll make it as good as I can I'll work really hard up until mm. then 
and then I, I love it it's like kind of like you've hatched this egg and you're just like yeah let let this bird fly and then it exists outside of you and, and sharing yeah I'm at a point now where like some of the poems where I'm like looking through my book I'm like well I could have done better with that I'm like okay so let's write a new poem on a similar theme but better yeah. and it's like <laughs> instead of trying to change this child anymore we're just going to create a new one and let it be a sibling to it you know <laughs> Yeah, that's and, such a and weird hope it's a little better. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's a weird analogy, I know. You oh, my little child. children. <laughs> and then I make my siblings compete. Sorry, my children all compete with their siblings and they all fight each other to the death. It's, yeah. it's very brutal. Until one of them is the best. Yes. Yeah, that makes yeah. Sense. Yeah. That's know. just good child rearing, probably. Of course. Right. Yeah. I'm a great. Yeah. I, I just think it's so great. I feel so lucky to get to work with people who are. Um, kind of like nearer the beginnings of their mm-hmm. like experiences of sharing things or yeah. who are less experienced with that because when they say how do I do it you just say sort of well just try and do it sometimes if, if... done is better than perfect oh say that again <laughs> sometimes done is better than perfect you merch you merch, <laughs> you merch. <laughs> that's so good it's what yeah. I live my life by and it helps because yeah. like with YouTube videos ask... sorry gun. No, I was going to ask for you to give me a piece of advice, but you just literally oh, gave yeah. it to me. <laughs> what were you saying? It's YouTube is what's got me in that mindset because you are constantly fighting against the algorithm and you need to put out content at a really good pace to stay relevant and to keep being remembered and keep people watching. So sometimes done is better than perfect. You could spend two months perfecting a video, but sometimes it's better to spend a week on it and get it out and get that interaction and then move on to the next one. And as long as it's, good enough you know as long as you're not being lazy as long as you're not spreading misinformation as long as you're not hurting anyone you know done is the best sometimes Mm -hmm. and I think that just tallies so much with the fact that we are our own harshest critics Mm -hmm. that your version of done will look to the outside as someone else's version of perfect but you just you you can only you when you're so inside your process you see how far you are away from this like made up imaginary goal of how good something should be but i love that and we look around each other and we look at people and they're like that's amazing that's amazing that's amazing i'm terrible but yeah just just sharing things and doing things is the key it's um it's something that i kept putting off like things like learning to paint properly as well for a really long time because i always looked at these other people as like not good enough i'm terrible like i'll never never be like that and then after a few years, I was like, well, I'm never going to get like that if I don't actually practice, am I? So I did start practicing. And now, like, I look back and I know if you saw, I put this Instagram post on the other day that was, like, one of my first ever watercolor paintings next to, like, mm-hmm. my most recent one. I was like, it's insane. Like, eight years ago or whatever it was when I did the first one, I could never imagine having the ability to do the one that I just made. But unless you actually do it and you make those imperfect pieces in the middle, you'll never get to a point where you're actually proud of what you're doing. You know, yeah. you learn from the mistakes as you go. And I think the important thing is not necessarily going back and I don't want to say, I don't want to say don't correct your mistakes. Like that's not what I mean, but I mean, sometimes you can hyper-focus on the past mistakes instead of using what you've learned from it to make something better going forward. Does mm. that make sense? Mm. Or like, so to put it in a really <laughs> handpan specific context, <laughs> If I'm performing and I make a technical error, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm a bad musician or a bad mm-hmm. player or a bad performer. I want to, in that performance, carry on. But then when I come home, I'm like, okay, so let me do half an hour a day for the next week of this specific motion so that then yeah. when I come and do the next thing, that's not a technical issue. That's a technical mm-hmm. strength. Yeah. And then I can make another mistake and find <laughs> something else to practice. But it's exactly like that. Like I've got, so my walls are basically covered in like paintings that I've done and stuff. And I know this is like slightly off topic now. We start with poetry and now I'm talking about paintings. And stuff. But like sometimes I'll make a mistake in my paintings. Like, oh, okay. I don't know if you can see these, but over there on the wall behind, uh, you can kind of see one of them up there. I've got these superhero paintings I've done. And one of them mm. is Poison Ivy and the other Starfire because I'm superheroes. And on both of them, I'm not very good at drawing hands. It's my weakness. I, I'm really, really bad with hands. But I love both those paintings because they're kind of part of my journey and they're special to me. But the Starfire one in particular has like, so she's doing this like powery motion like this. And oh my God, the weird thumbs on one of them. I don't know what I did, but I drew it terribly. 
And I was like, when I was doing that, I was like, oh God, have I, have I ruined the whole painting, like painting this badly? Like, should I just scrap it? And I was like, no, I'm going to enjoy it the way it is. And then when I moved on and did my Poison Ivy one, I was like, I'm going to fix that error and make sure I don't make the same thumb issue on that. And her hands are a lot better. Not perfect. I'm still bad at it, but less deformed and dislocated thumbs, you know? <laughs> so it's one of those things. I could have stressed longer on the Starfire painting and worried over that and potentially like made more of a mess trying to fix it or could have just taken that error and learned from it and made a new better painting in a different way and I did. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know if I'm ranting. No, it makes sense. Okay. So Rachel, if someone has a piece of art that they are <laughs> clutching to their chest right now, what would you say to them? Let me see it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just simple as that, just like, let me see. Like if they're, if they're scared to show someone, just show one person to start with, you know, see what they think, um, mm -hmm. get, get some feedback, get some encouragement and, yeah. you know, take, take that little leap of faith, do it. Yeah. Cause it's terrifying and it's scary, but it's worth it. Like I, I often tell students to share first with someone who mm -hmm. isn't a musician, but who loves you mm. and they'll be like, great. Like, I love that you've been on stage that was such a or you know shared that with me yeah and then the next stage is maybe someone who also loves you but maybe is a musician yeah and then after that we go out into the wider world of people who yeah. don't love us <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a great idea I like that a lot I think it's hard though sometimes like um I think a lot of people expect to get encouragement from their family and stuff but it doesn't always come from those places so sometimes you kind of have to find your own family you know yeah. Like, that's why I really appreciate having, like, you and Kieran and Daisy and Carrie Ann and everyone who's been really encouraging. And I don't think I would have done half of what I've done these last few years without you guys. Um, so Same. Having lot. people around you who are incredibly accomplished and creative and brilliant, and when they tell you feedback, it holds so much weight. Like, yeah. I think that's also so important. Yeah. Once you get a bit braver and you're past the kind of, you know, really internal, yeah. showing it to people who are incredible artists in their own right and can help support you in that way it's another amazing step yeah I think it's interesting though because um like I say my parents have always been the kind of people who want to stay in the background they don't think you should make a fuss about anything they don't want you stepping out and like you know they didn't really understand my YouTube channel for a long time they didn't they still don't understand why people watch me you know that sort of thing and when I was performing at Glastonbury last year, like on the way there, I left my dog with my parents and my mum was like, but I don't get why you're going. I went, what do you mean? And she went, well, you're just you, aren't you? I don't know why they want you. And I was like, thanks mother, great. And I got back and told her how it was. And she was like, oh, I still don't really understand, but okay. And then I put my first poetry video out on YouTube, like reading one of my poems. And she literally like called me and went, oh, I didn't know you could write that well. And I was like, mum. <laughs> God's sake. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes you need to be careful where you look for encouragement, is what I'd say. Right. Yeah, maybe it's like about casting the net wide. You can't yeah. rely on one person to to fulfill you, I guess, in anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, making sure that you've got multiple support systems and different things for, for different different people for different things, maybe, yeah. or different areas. You know, it's like um, if I need advice, I'll phone up one of my friends if I want advice about doing the sensible thing, and I'll phone up my <laughs> other friend and just be like, "Do it! It's gonna be great." <laughs> I like that. Uh, am I the irresponsible one? <laughs> <laughs> I could never tell. <laughs> Mentioning no name. <laughs> right. Okay. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to share on the being brave? Oh God. Um. I think the only thing I'd say is that to anyone listening, like it doesn't matter who you are or your background or your age or anything like that. If you want to do something, you go ahead and do it. It's never too late. It's never the wrong time. If you feel like there's some sort of barrier to entry, then figure out what that is and how you can overcome it and then just go for it, you know? Mm. And if you're wanting to do something, but you feel you can't now because, you know, you don't have the time, you don't have the money, you don't have the opportunities or whatever, then don't just feel like oh well i can never do it give yourself some time work through whatever that is and then give it a go yeah. never too late. Yeah. sorry never too late. rambling <laughs> no i just loved that i was just thinking never too late 
and don't compare yourself to the people who are at the top of whatever that thing mm-hmm. is just come in where you are where you're at and share where it's at right now and if the hands look weird that's okay <laughs> a little deformed thumbs that's the thing though i i find it's better to not compare yourself to other people but compare yourself to your past self so i set myself these little goals based on what i need to achieve so sometimes it's something like get the hands right on a painting or it'll be like um you know do such and such a performance at this venue or you know i i have a thing now where i want to try and get at least one of my paintings in like a little tiny local gallery things like that and it's just it's such a small thing but you've got to start small and compare yourself to your past self rather than to other people like if i sat here and was like okay so i want to be the next banksy and i want my painting selling for millions of dollars and i want them here and here like that would be silly and stupid and i don't think i could achieve that in this lifetime so i don't be setting myself up for failure (laughs) no but like i feel like i'd be setting myself up for failure because you've got such a big goal and it's like well how do you even get to that point what are the steps you you don't know so start with something small you know one painting local gallery giving myself a couple of years to do that and i'm gonna gonna do that eventually you know (laughs) so amazing steps measurable small steps yes thank you so yeah. much Rachel this was such an interesting oh. conversation and <laughs> I haven't rambled too interesting... much <laughs> no you didn't ramble at all it was great um we had another really interesting conversation over on Rachel's channel so I will put links to that everywhere and uh, do subscribe to her if you haven't already if only to find out about gin I mean that sounded so interesting <laughs> it, it's great it's called something like um the twisted history of mother's ruin or something like that so it's like the feminist history of gin and how like rich white men have suppressed women and their gin businesses for hundreds of years yeah it's great great video and also i'm tasting gins in it and i make a little cocktail at the end so incredible i wish i'd been there for that one (laughs) Um, oh don't worry i still have so many gins left next time you visit (laughs) yes only for the video right (laughs) (laughs) Um, And yeah, if you think that you might want to make poetry or art or any sort of thing, just start to do it, start to create it and start to share it. We are all ready to be performers and sharers. It's just about opening out what's inside and sharing it with the world. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) I hate indie medias too. But thank you so much for having me. That was lovely. I really enjoyed that.